was grace that taught my heart to feel and embrace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are
Again, friends, and thank you for joining us on this Mother's Day Sunday. It is May the 10th, and uh, this is another coronavirus milestone for us because ordinarily we would we would prefer to be coming down to the church with our families, I'm sure, and, and just celebrating some of the most important people in our lives. And we're not able to do that because of physical distancing rules and that kind of thing, but we want you to know that as a church, we value motherhood. As individuals, we value motherhood. If you're a mother out there, or you uh, have have served in that role in somebody's life, and we want to say that is an important role, and we honor and acknowledge that here today. Thank you for what you have done in that regard. And there's a great verse in the prophecy of Isaiah where where God is speaking through the prophet himself, speaking as his voice, and he's this prophet is speaking with his voice, and he says, "I will comfort you." God says, "I will comfort you." And then he looks for a, a comparable to use so that people can relate to that. And this is what he comes up with. He says, I will comfort you like a mother comforts her child. That's a pretty good commendation, isn't it? That God, the way God comforts us is modeled after the way uh, that we uh, are comforted by a mother as well. And so again, we just say that whether you're listening in online uh, or whether you're listening in on our toll-free telephone line, or maybe for some people they'll hear this when they come to our Sunday morning service uh, that's an outdoor drive-in service, we want to value you uh, on this special day. Well, during our Sunday mornings for the past month or so, we've been spending most of our time just looking at really uh, the, the last chapter of the earthly life of Jesus with particular focus on the visits that he made, the various visits he made with people between the time that he was raised from the dead and when he returned uh, back to heaven at the right hand of God the Father. And basically, after the events of Easter and the saga of the empty tomb, Jesus started making a few appearances to some of those who were closest to him. He, he made those appearances really to reignite their hope and to rekindle their passion, to prepare them for the coming of the Holy Spirit who would give them what they would need to spread the good news of God's love for people to a world that, that, that they knew at the time and by extension all around the globe and down through the generations to the present day. And if you read about it in the Bible, I, I think you'll see that they needed that that his friends and followers needed it. Because when Jesus died, the truth is that his followers became pretty confused for a little while. They became discouraged and despondent. It became fearful even. It had, it had taken a toll on them emotionally. And, and God knew that. Like he foreknew it even. He could see it coming. And as a response to it, what he wanted for, for those friends and followers of Jesus was for them to be able to see him in his resurrected body and to extinguish really all the other images that have been replaying like some kind of horrible 
uh, rotating slideshow in their mind. Images uh, of Jesus draped in purple, standing in front of a mocking, a mocking crowd. Images of the crown of thorns pressed into his forehead. Uh, images from his flogging. Images from him carrying his cross through the streets of Jerusalem. And for the ones who stuck around long enough to see it at least, images of him being nailed to that cross, suspended on that hill like some kind of common criminal awaiting his execution. It's not that God wanted them uh, to forget all of those things, uh, but he didn't want them, he didn't want that to be the most, uh, the lasting image that, that they had of him either, because the greatest part of Jesus' story is that he didn't stay dead, right? Like he defeated death. And so after he was raised from the dead, Jesus made all of these unannounced visits, we, or sometimes we call them appearances, to those who knew him and, and knew him best in order for them all to know that this wasn't the end of the story. These were hope-renewing experiences. And we've looked at a number of those appearances during the last few weeks. We looked at his appearance to Mary Magdalene, uh, who had personally known the power of God's healing in her life and who was actually the first to come to the tomb on Easter Sunday morning, you might remember, and the last to leave after they discovered the empty tomb. Jesus appears to Mary of Magdalene in the garden and he calls her by name and she recognizes his voice and is overcome with joy. It's a beautiful story. And, and then we looked at Jesus' appearance to his disciples when he literally appeared to them behind the locked doors of the building that they were hiding in and told them that basically the mission wasn't over for them that he was gonna be sending them out with a mission of his love, and he reminded them that his spirit would be coming to enable him to do it. And of course, next there was that other appearance that Jesus made to his disciples, really for Thomas's benefit, primarily for Thomas, where Thomas got to see the wounds in Jesus' hands and, and, and in his side and to declare his ongoing allegiance as well. And with every single appearance, the legend of Jesus starts to grow. And the mission of Jesus gets reborn. And those who were closest to Jesus were newly inspired. And when I read about all that, I, like I still get chills about it because he's my Lord too. Like, I, and I can imagine myself right there with him. Maybe that's something that you do as well. But the thing that I've been thinking about lately is that in the midst of all this excitement and maybe even some of the speculation that might have been building about where he you know, might show up next, there's one person that Jesus was close to that I keep looking for him to appear to, and it, it never happens, or at least not that we have record of. And that's to his mother, Mary. We don't have, have any record of Jesus appearing to his mother, Mary, after he'd risen from the dead. And I mean, it's not like there'd been distance between the two of them. We assume his earthly father, Joseph, died a number of years earlier, so there's no expectation for him. But Mary was, she was there with him to the end, like to the very end. In fact, she's the one who, uh, who she was one of the few people who went with him all the way to Calvary's Hill. And she was close enough to him at his execution that he could speak to her directly from the cross and have her hear him. And I wanna just read that short story uh, for you, if that's okay. It's found in John's Gospel, that's where we've been spending most of our time. And in chapter 19, in verses 25 to 27, and it says this, there's a few comments about some of the things that, that was leading up to it, some of the indignities that were afforded Jesus. And then it tells us this, John says, standing near the cross were Jesus' mother, Mary, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene again. I'm assuming Mary was a common name in those days. When Jesus saw his mother Mary standing there beside the disciple he loved, who we know to be John, he said to her, dear woman, here is your son. And he said to this disciple, here is your mother. And from then on, the disciple took her into his home. And that is the last interaction, interaction that gets recorded for us between Jesus and his mother. Literally, these are his last words to her. Dear woman, here is your son. And, and forgive me for saying it, but it, it doesn't even sound all that intimate, does it? Like, in fact, it kind of sounds transactional to me. That's the word I'm using. It sounds like Jesus is putting some distance between them. I mean, for starters, he calls her woman. Like, who calls their mother woman? 
Like, it's Mother's Day, so if you feel inspired, I'm just going to say go ahead and try it. If you're speaking to your mother today, those of you who can do that, just say to her, Happy Mother's Day, a woman, and see how that goes over. It's not the term that we would ordinarily expect a son to be using when he's speaking to his mother, the woman who raised him. And, and so, but even in the original Greek language of the New Testament, the word that he uses here, it just means exactly that. It just means woman. It's the same word that he used when he was talking to the woman at the well in Samaria in chapter 4. It's the same word that Jesus used when he was talking to the woman who was caught in adultery in chapter 8. It was the word that anyone would use when they were referring to any other person, even a stranger who happened to be a woman. Jesus says to her, dear woman. And then this is the transactional part that I was talking about. He looks at her and he says, here's your son. And to John again, here's your mother. And the Bible says that John took her into his home from that point forward. And I mean, none of that is a bad thing. Like Jesus was making sure his mother was being cared for. Uh, he was making sure that her, her, her needs were being met. But there's something else that's going on here too that might actually explain a little bit of why Jesus didn't specifically make a special appearance to his mother Mary, after he'd been raised from the dead. And that's that in that moment, he was actually saying something significant to her. He was saying basically, listen, our relationship has been a good relationship. It's been a mother-son relationship, but it's changing now. And I know up until this moment, I've just always been your little boy, uh, and, and a mother's always a mother, so I don't expect that, to, your, you know, your heart to change on that. But just like you were told when you were first, when you first found out that God had placed a child in your womb that, who, who would be for all people, my primary identity to you, especially now that this is all about to be fulfilled, is no longer son, but it is Savior. And, and I can't say that Mary would have been thinking about this in the moment. I don't know what she would have been thinking, but I'm reminded of the words of the old man Simeon that he spoke over Jesus during, during Jesus' dedication in the temple only shortly after he was born. In Luke chapter 2, in verses 28 to 35, it tells us that Simeon took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you've promised. I've seen your salvation that you have prepared for all people. Like this is the great bold declaration, isn't it? He is a light to reveal God to the nations. He is the glory of your people Israel. And it says Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. But, and then Simeon blessed them. And there's this interesting interaction. He said to Mary, the baby's mother. Now Joseph's there too, but this was a message to her directly. Probably because as a prophetic word, God knew that she would be the one standing there in the end when Jesus was crucified. He said, this child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall and many others to rise. He has been sent as a sign to God, but many will oppose him. And as a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And a sword, listen, a sword will pierce your very soul. And in John 19, this was the piercing of Mary's soul. But out of that piercing, Jesus' mandate was being fulfilled and life was being offered to all those who know him, not by any other relationship other than that of a rescuer being rescued. And it's interesting that while this is the last interaction we have with, uh, of Jesus and, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, it's not the last we hear about Mary, the follower of Jesus. And in fact, the Bible makes a point of letting us know that she was there in Acts chapter one. You can read about it with all the other followers of Jesus waiting for the promised Holy Spirit to come. And so my prayer for all of us is that we would know what Mary knew and what so many others would come to know along with her in those early days of the Christian church, down through history even to our current day, that Jesus is who he says he is because he did what he said he would do. And that by putting our complete trust in him, we can have life in his name. God bless you, friends, on this Mother's Day Sunday. Enjoy your day together, and Lord willing, we'll see you again next time. Bye for now.